So, concurrent with an increasing international exchange of goods and ideas, so at the same time there was an increasing international exchange of goods and ideas, larger numbers of Americans began struggling with how to match democratic political ideals that were set forth earlier to political institutions and social realities. So this is key concept of 4.1 room numeral 2, and again it's about how we were struggling to match, to live up to our ideals, how we thought we should be. All right, we get to the second GA, which is the second Great Awakening, all right, which uh, taught people that humans have what's called perfectibility, meaning any human can be made better, they can be saved, and they are equal before God. And that set forth, uh, in many people's eyes, a reform movement. Since people can be reformed, we should try to do that. Remember, the First Great Awakening taught about um, predetermination. Hey, it's determined beforehand. This time it's saying, no, it's not. You can be saved. And eventually it will become, so can society. Society can be saved, too. All right, so when we say help inspire humans to achieve perfection, we mean perfectibility, and we don't mean perfect. We mean we can be better. We can become better, we can improve, and we can reform. Hence the, quote, antebellum reform movement. We get Charles G. Finney giving massive sermons to convert individuals, the same types of revival sermons we talked about with the First Great Awakening. Examples of this. Another example of this we have in Seneca Falls in 1848, the first ever women's rights convention in upstate New York, uh, hosted or organized by Elizabeth Stanton and Lucretia Mott. We have utopian societies popping up uh, that felt that we can live better as a people. Again, we will get more into these things. This is an overview. But these are examples of us trying to reform ourselves. Seneca, the Seneca Falls Convention, the, these utopian societies in the, the uh, Brook Farm, for example, where we thought we could live uh, a more, in, in a more perfect society. We also have African Americans and their, their citizenship possibilities uh, continuing to be restricted even though the international slave trade, as you know, was outlawed in 1808 from Africa, not the domestic one. We have an increasing number of African Americans that were free in the North and the South. We don't forget there were half a million free blacks down South when the Civil War began. Eventually, many states make it illegal. This is a pushback. As you get more and more free blacks, especially down South, black people lose more and more of their freedom down South. So eventually, many states make it illegal for slave owners to manumit their slaves. When you are letting go one or two or a few of your slaves on your plantation, that's manumitting them. If it's done statewide or nationwide, that's emancipation. So manumit means a small number. All right. So you also find during this era discussions of emancipation plans. You have guys like, as we will get to, uh, William Lloyd Garrison writes The Liberator, calling for immediate and uncompensated end to slavery. He is the new, this new type of abolitionist starting in the 1830s. Before him, to be anti-slavery more or less meant to be a colonizationist. All right, the American Colonization Society, advocating that uh, we free the slaves and we also send them back to Africa. All right, that's a colonizationist. In the 1830s, we begin to see the abolitionists, white abolitionists, I should say. Uh, black people were always abolitionists. Moving on, key concept 4.1, room numeral 2, continued. All right, resistance to initiatives for democracy. Push back against the abolition movement. We have pro-slavery arguments that increased drastically after Nat Turner's slave rebellion in 1831. You, guys, you get guys like John C. Calhoun arguing, not that slavery is an economic necessity, but it's a good thing. We're helping them civilize. They are working under better conditions in the South than in the industrial conditions up in the North where the market revolution is taking, taking place. All right, so he's arguing slaves down South have it better than white workers up North. So we're more civilized down South here. Uh, some advocates are using the Bible to justify slavery, specific passages from the Bible. 
that that demand that you obey your earthly master you'll you'll you wind up with plantation own uh, slave owners uh, preaching on the plantation to their slaves although slaves will get a very much different message from the Bible when they look at stories like the Mo the story of Moses for example so pulling different messages from the good book all right you get George Fitzhugh making similar arguments as Calhoun uh, although as you will see in class uh, there was a stronger tone to them but the same type of arguments they're savage and we are civilizing them we're doing them a favor here they took their paternalistic role very seriously there down south xenophobia fear of the foreigner it was during this era that the Irish began showing up in the 1830s and more so in the 1840s when the potato stopped growing in Ireland so xenophobia is the fear of foreigners or as the uh, AP people like to call it nativism so you would wind, you would wind up with native born Americans meaning white Anglo-Saxon Protestants being hostile to foreign born individuals namely the Irish immigrants were accused of stealing jobs because they were working they, they were competing for many of the same jobs uh, foreign workers tend to work for less money the Irish were heavily uh, discriminated against believing that they stole elections they were voting a number of times each illegal you know voter fraud and stuff like that immigrants tend to vote Democrat so you want you end up with these native born nativist Republicans arguing the Irish would help the Democrats steal elections you wind up with again this native backlash in the political realm with the know nothing party um, that they would terrorize the Irish uh, on the streets but in the political realm they were the know nothing party and they hoped to pass immigration restriction laws and they became a powerful political party in the 18 uh, I don't, I'm, they, they were eventually absorbed by the Republican Party all right um, again this is an overview we will talk about them throughout the year so the no, no, no nothing party represents the the political backlash to immigration very similar to the American Protective Association of the late 19th century we also find a pushback with anti-black sentiments in political and popular culture minstrel shows became very popular during the 19th century during this era where uh, white people would dress up in blackface and act silly on stage remember it was uh, one of the ways slaves resisted slavery and one of the safer ways was to uh, act dimwitted on the plantation work slow uh, I just don't get a boss and that was kind of a double-edged sword it became the stereotype they, they're stupid so white crowds ate it up when white people would dress up in blackface go up on stage and act silly and those were known as the minstrelsy the most well one of the more well-known minstrel characters was Jim Crow of the Jim Crow laws all right we also wind up with anti-democratic tendencies in in the Indian in Indian policies as we will get to later in the unit uh, the Indian Removal Act which became known as the Trail of Tears when uh, five civilized tribes of Indians on the southeast coast of the United States were forced to move out to the Plain States namely Kansas and Oklahoma um, the Supreme Court found in favor of the Indians in Worcester versus Georgia but Jackson uh, ignored it and he actually didn't make them move his predecessor Van Buren is the one who made them uh, most of them walk to the plain states and that became known as the trail of tears again this is an overview all right so key concept 4.1 Roman numeral 3 while Americans celebrated their nation's progress toward a unified new national culture that blended old world forms with new world ideas various groups of the nation's inhabitants developed distinctive cultures of their own so now we get the emergence of a new national culture it was a combination of European and local cultures you found new American art literature and architectural ideas emerging example you have John James Audubon who made very significant contributions to the study of birds uh, he made Prince of Birds and he became known worldwide you also get the Hudson River School it was an art 
uh, of artists, and they focused on landscape paintings, kind of this tension between nature and um, the encroaching civilization upon nature. And they believed nature was a source of uh, a great source of wisdom and inspiration. And this is a painting by Thomas Cole of the Hudson River School against landscape painting. It shows the tension between impending civilization, you see that gentleman down there, uh, and nature. Uh, and again, this is the Hudson River School. Moving on. We also have cultures developing based on their interests and experiences. Uh, for example, the Indians began to change when they were forced to move westward. All right, uh, the reservation system developed in the 1840s as a way of living for the Indians, where Indians were forced onto reservations. Uh, women, more women were, uh, were beginning to attend uh, schools of higher education. We also have what will become known in this unit as the cult of domesticity. Uh, during this time frame, women began to evolve from Republican motherhood to the cult of, cult of domesticity. To make a long story short, uh, it was the uh, century in which we began to urbanize. We began to move more towards commercialization, towards commerce, towards capitalism. We were lo so losing our so-called virtuous ways or in danger of losing our so-called virtuous ways. And we had kind of an, uh, a national nervous breakdown, and uh, women were put in charge of keeping us virtuous and moral. They were to stay in the home and remoralize us when we got home from the big, big, big bad world of commerce. All right, the home was kind of like a, a haven in a heartless world. And again, this cult of domesticity, 1830s, 1840s, and on. We had the Seneca Falls Convention, 1848, first women's rights movement that came out of, again, women becoming more uh, educated. Formally, I should say. All right. So, also during this time frame, we had the Shakers and the Mormons, two religions that developed. Okay. The Shakers were called that because they would dance around on the floor with shake. They practiced celibacy. They believed in sexual equality. We have the Mormons who developed during this time period, who begin on the East Coast, after years of turbulence on the East Coast. Uh, they moved to Utah, Salt Lake City, where they could freely practice their religion, and they agreed to give up the, the polygamy thing uh, to be recognized uh, as a formal religion. We also have an urban middle class developing, as cities are developing in this time frame. More and more Americans were owning larger shops and businesses and becoming professionals. A managerial class was developing. All right, as you will see throughout the market revolution. So you were getting this kind of this middle class bourgeois uh, living in urban areas, living in large houses that they owned, buying new inventions, the cast iron stove, for example. Instead of making it ourselves, they were buying it. All right, you have enslaved African Americans creating communities. Uh, and they sought to protect their family structures and dignity. Remember, since many uh, slave families were sold apart, very often you would have non-blood relatives uh, being called using familial type names, like the uncle, for example. Uh, so basically, slaves found any way on the plantation to survive as best they could, given the, the uh, situation. When families were separated via slavery, others would look after them as if they were family members. We have slave music um, on the plantation. It was used to help pass the time while working. Uh, Negro spirituals, for example. Sometimes the slave owner would confuse this for them being happy. Instrumental. Uh, this, was in it was an this music was an instrumental part of their religious services. Others played important roles in the abolitionist and reform movements and sought to change their status by others, I mean other slaves and runaway slaves, free blacks. An example, David Walker writes in 1829 an appeal to the colored citizens of the world in which he was urging uh, African Americans to fight back. He was appealing to them to fight back and he was writing <clears throat> largely in response to Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, which was uh, extremely racist in certain uh, at certain points. 
And two years later, we have Nat Turner's Rebellion occurring in 1831, which helped strengthen the desire to silence abolitionism in the South. All right, test steps were at the end. From the multiple choice questions, um, know about Native American interactions under the new nation, uh, the reasons for the development of the first and second political party system, uh, the, evo the evolution from Republican motherhood to the cult of domesticity, what was expected of women. For the essay questions, um, know the issues that led to, the, again, the creation of political parties, the impact of the Second Great Awakening leading to the reform movements of the antebellum era, and be sure to take the quiz that will pop up right now.